my house is always the place where nobody was there, where it was okay to have parties. Began with alcohol, drinking with friends. I mean, I definitely went to parties and had fun. Just partying, wanting to fit in, just like any other kid. We want to think that there's a logical process that's going on. For young people, there is no logical process. Their behavior is impulsive. They don't think logically through a process. In the beginning, yeah, I got high and it was fun. Nobody ever plans on, you know, going farther than that, but, you know, one thing obviously leads to another. And they think to themselves, they didn't tell me I was going to experience this. They didn't say it was going to feel good. They told me it was bad. Therefore, everything they've told me about substances has to be called into questions. So then when they take a drug that has some legitimate greater risk, they're less afraid to consume that substance. I already tried this one thing. What's the next going to hurt? Once I found opiates, that was obviously the last step. You will become consumed by it. It will control every part of your life. There's going to come a day where you're not doing it because it's fun anymore, and if you think that you can just walk away and put it down, you're kidding yourself because you can't. You will lose friends. You'll lose touch with family. There's no control. and. The scary part is you lose control without realizing it's happening. People won't like the person you will have become, and neither will you. This is not it, you know, your life doesn't stop just at high school. There's so much more to life. As a society, we have done a disservice to young people. We go to this place where we talk about the fact that drugs are dangerous, you can die from taking drugs, all drugs are bad, don't do drugs. I remember when I was 13 or 14, the first thing that I said is, you're not me. You're not me and I'm not you, and that's your story. The more teachers, parents, anybody told us not to do something, we did it. We wanted it mainly curiosity. We want to know why they're telling us no. We want to know why they're telling us we should not do it. Of course, I'm sad he's gone, and it hurts all the time that I lost my best friend and my brother. But I'm also angry that he thought that he could do it. He thought he could do it, get away with it, and be OK. But that's not the case. That's definitely not the case. OK. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. The purpose of uh, today's uh, conference is to discuss uh, developments in heroin prosecution and uh, the heroin uh, and opiate prescription medication problem here in Vermont more generally. Skip is here today to discuss with you the impact this has had on his family. We're really here today to talk more about the education. With Skip's help, uh, and the collaboration of a lot of other people as well. We've developed a public service announcement that highlights the dangers of narcotic, opiate, and heroin use. With that, I'd like to play the public service announcement. My son William is an extremely passionate person, hence his success in ski racing, his success in the molecular genetics major at the University of Vermont. It's that same passion that convinced Will to try heroin. He was found dead the morning of March 23rd from a heroin overdose. I have had friends, very good friends, ask me the question, what would you say if you could talk to Will again? I would say, I love you, Will. And soon after that, I would say, what did you think you were doing? What I want people watching this to know is that you might be the brightest guy in the world and the best skier, but you're mortal. This can happen to you. Please don't make your friends and family have to live the unthinkable. And I am without one of the most remarkable people I have ever known in my life because of it. And it kills me every day. I'm only giving you this information to let you know that Will is probably similar to the kind of person that you guys are. He loved the edge. He was a ski racer from grade three. He lived to ski. He loved it. Um, one of the things his brother and I did was to spread some of his ashes on Sugarloaf, which is his favorite hill. There hasn't been a day where I haven't, haven't thought about it. And, like, 
it might have taken his life, but it took part of all of ours, I think. He was in many ways my hero. Uh, I know his brother and sister look up to him tremendously to this day. Every time we'd go skiing, we'd race down the hill, and he'd usually win because he was a lot, he was better skier than I was. But I was pretty close behind, but this year, I kind of lost interest. It doesn't, it doesn't really interest me. I don't know how to explain it too well. I never knew anything in human experience could be this hard, and I, that's from the bottom of my heart. I, it's just, it's, it's beyond comprehension. I never knew a human being could feel this much pain. It's, it has redefined the rest of my life. For the first time in my life, I've ever seen my dad have tears in his eyes. You know, um, seeing his son like that, I couldn't imagine. I can imagine seeing my child like that. I mean, I skinny, face sucked in. I mean, you could just you could just see big dark circles under my eyes. Um, I look like your typical junkie. But more than anything, from a point standpoint of education, people need to understand how incredibly dangerous heroin and these oxycontin pills really are. You may think that uh, uh, you're you're just buying onto a, a short time high. I tried it, and that was it. I got that first high of that that sinking feeling of just you know everything else shut shut the world out and just laid back and just let it let it take me over. And I had things, and within a year, it was all gone. It's all gone. House, car, everything. Other things that are important to most people, they took a back seat. You know, it's like if you've got a certain amount of money and you pick between getting something to eat that day or getting drugs, you're going to go with the drugs. That is not a decision. I look back now and I kick myself in the ass for all the, de all the bad decisions I made concerning drugs. There is no good decision with drugs. A lot of the people that you think are your friends aren't gonna end up being your friends. You know, once the drugs are gone and you realize that everybody else is gone too, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's not a good feeling. Nobody wants to get high just by themselves. I mean, eventually you will if you have to, if it comes down to, you know, your last fix between you and them. It's horrible to think, you know, all right, well now I'm all alone and just have to face that reality that the only people that you thought were your friends just were there because of the drugs. I'll get to a point where, you know, I'll do what I need to do to get that feeling. Right now in the Chittenden Clinic, 80% of the clients who present for treatment identify prescription medications of all types as their primary drug of abuse. It is not in the economic or social policy interests of the state of Vermont to continue to underfund opiate addiction treatment. Attitudes of permissiveness, peer pressure, uh, poor decision making to begin with, there's not much to stand in the way of uh, that very first hit or that very first pill or that very first foray into something that could have and in many times does have tragic consequences for someone's life. And people are engaging in low level crime to support habits of two, three, four, uh, oxy 80s a day, and the amount of crime that is required to support those habits is significant. Because they're, they have a stamp of approval for use in one respect by the FDA, the kids think that they're not dangerous. Taking the drug outside of a legitimately prescribed prescription on your own now moves the consumption of a safe drug into an unsafe way of consuming the drug. And I think that's where logic comes in, but again, young people particularly don't necessarily think logically. As a young person thinking, this is a safe drug because it came from the pharmacy, I know what its dosage is, I can take it and it's safe. The reality is that that consumption can lead to uh, untoward outcomes. Oxycontin is the same thing as heroin, really. I mean. Indirectly, it's synthetic heroin, uh, and at once, once I was already doing oxycontin, uh, just knowing that it was synthetic heroin, I guess made it okay in my mind. 
that. I mean, I'm already doing synthetic heroin. What's what's doing a bag of heroin gonna hurt, you know? Hell, it may even get me higher. But it didn't. It was more of a financial decision, not having a lot of income and just, you know, finishing up high school and working minimum wage job. It, it's cheaper to buy a bag of heroin. Virtually every individual that I've known who's been addicted to opiates is uh, virtually a day doesn't go by when they don't think about opiates. If we encourage young people to think, to think and to feel from the earliest age as opposed to believing that we can think for them or feel for them, we'll be in a much better position for them, for young people to make decisions, which ultimately will affect the rest of their lives. Nothing is a simple decision, but the decisions that you have to make, especially the real difficult ones, are some of the most important ones. You really need to stop and think about where you're going to be with that in six months, a year. I mean, it can bring you to some horrible places. And I am prime example of what happens when you go that far and how hard it is to come back. Doing drugs, there's only a couple ways it's gonna turn out, which is you're either gonna die or you're gonna go to jail. Like nobody, nobody does it forever and just cruises through life without one of those two things happening. There's plenty of things for you to look at that can show you how quick it can become a downward spiral that you can't control. It started off just something that I was doing once in a while. You know, it wasn't something that uh, was um, something that I had planned on, you know, ruining my life with. But um, eventually, you know, the one thing that it did do for me is it would take me out of that element. Any feeling, whether it be happy or sad, I no longer had to feel when I was on that substance. I could just be. It convinces you that it's there for all the right reasons and, and cares about you, but it'll leave you in a second and drop you, you know, just leave you sick, laying on the floor, feeling like you're gonna die, but as soon as it walks back into your life, you, you forget about the bad and everything's great again. Like, it's, it's honestly, the only word I can think of for heroin, opiates in general, is just evil, like pure evil. It just led to more problems, more, more hassle, more drama. This is not a problem that law enforcement is going to solve. The point at which we begin prosecuting someone and looking for alternatives is the point at which we failed. You might have another chance. You might have a chance to think your actions through. He would always tell me, Dad, I've got it under control. I know what I'm doing. He was right so often that I came to believe him. I distanced myself a lot because I was, I felt like if I got too close, they might see what was really going on. And I was, I mean, I was lying to no end. I was telling them I had a job when I didn't. Once you get into it, once you try it, you find something you like and it's that addicting, it is almost impossible to return from. I don't think it's easy for kids to, to ask for help. You know, especially within the high schools and stuff now because you have like a lot of stuff that's going on. You know, you have high schools are really cliquish. I don't know how your school was, but high schools can be really cliquish, you know, like who are you really gonna to go to with your problem that might not advertise that problem all over the place? But the reality is recovery is possible, but you have to be willing to take the step to move in that direction. Okay. Well, so, so thinking back um, last week, we talked about um, you know, setting a goal for what yeah. you're gonna work on and the time that we spend together. Strength and life skills. And uh, trying to get back into a lot of things that I, uh, lost a lot of things that I stopped doing because of drugs. It all boils down to 
helping people believe in themselves that they can actually gain the skills to achieve everything that they want to achieve in life. Go for what, what you want in life and don't let anything stop you. I mean, those problems are still going to be there once that high goes away. So you're not doing yourself any favors by thinking that getting high is going to help things because, you know, all the stuff that's going on before you get high that's bothering you, as soon as you're not high anymore, that stuff is still going to be there. And most of the times it's going to be even worse because you've, I don't know, you've put it off or ignored it and problems don't just go away. Life isn't always easy and, you know, life isn't always fair and sometimes there's a lot and often there's a lot of pain. My high school class, they were graduating from college and I was going to jail, which was, I mean, that was depressing to think that I had wasted so much time. I had learned about Burlington from a, a friend of mine and he had just said, you know, that the drug scene out there was, was kind of going on, you know, and that, you know, uh, heroin was becoming bigger and my habit at the time was becoming bigger. You know, and I guess I wasn't really going to stop until I got arrested or until I was dead. I mean, to be 100% honest. There really is no single story. It's not only people from poor backgrounds. It's not only people from single family homes. It's not only, you know, people whose parent is an alcoholic. Um, it's not only people who've been forced to move from location to location. I mean, all of the stereotypes that I think become easy to grab onto as a way to try to understand this dilemma that we face don't apply. The stereotype that does apply is that we've been conditioned and educated to believe that taking drugs makes us feel good and that it's safe to do it. I had gone to a place where uh, eventually I found out later on that it was Will's house. Um, Will had had some people over that night. Um, I was there with a friend. I met Will one time. Will said, you know, how you doing? I'm William, I'm William Gates. Uh, this is my house and I'm having this little get together, whatever. It can help young people make better decisions, more informed decisions. We can help them stay alive. If we do our job well, perhaps we can save at least one other family from having to live the unthinkable. Please, please believe me, it will have been worth it. Prescription drug abuse is considered the fastest growing drug problem in our country. And in the past year, one in 17 abused prescription drugs to get high. Those are extremely alarming numbers. You take things like Oxycontin when you see children, preteens, being addicted. We have a problem. I want Vermont and what we do in our prevention to be a model for the rest of the country. We are bombarded uh, as individuals that taking substances to alter how one feels is normative. It's a normal, appropriate behavior. You can't watch television, you can't turn on the radio, you can't open a newspaper magazine without seeing or being confronted with some advertisement or commercial to take a drug to make you feel better to make you feel different. You, you try something, you like it, and it's a downward spiral from there. And it took me years and years to realize that and recognize it. I don't want to minimize the fact that there are some drugs, and opiates are one of them, in which sometimes the first time you take it can be the last time. There were a lot of people I knew that OD'd and a lot of them that didn't, you know, they didn't come back from it. Life can definitely be hard. It, uh, you know, the decisions that we make affect us and, you know, the loved ones that are around us. Reach out to people you think might judge you because I would have, I would have been pleasantly surprised had I reached out because they wouldn't have turned their back on me when you know, you know, that they really are your friends and they care. Right now at 22, uh, I, I should have been at this point three years ago, four years ago, but unfortunately I wasted that time. Having to kind of catch up on life having family around again and good friends, friends that are there to support you, friends that 
you know, don't do drugs, don't want to do drugs, don't want you to do drugs. That all keeps me from going back because when you get mixed up with something like Oxycontin, you lose all that. I would say that I'm sorry, but I think that sorry wouldn't be enough. You know, I, I apologize deeply. I never wanted anybody to die. I never wanted anybody to get hurt. There's been many tear-filled nights in cells that, you know, that I've, that I've had to go through thinking about that, you know? I'm sure it's not the greatest thing to see your youngest, your youngest child get sentenced to 16 years in prison. I mean, I don't even know if my parents are going to be alive when I come home. It's one situation that I think of all the time, you know? How are they going to feel if, you know, one of them's on their deathbed, and, you know? The only thing they can think about is that I'm in prison. Instead of going and picking up drugs, if I had just had a conversation with someone or dealt with the problem head on, I think it would have been much more productive and the outcome certainly would have been better. I definitely think that friends and close friends can get through. They have to. You have to. You can't. You don't want to lose a friend. He was always there to be ahead of me, but he's not. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how smart you are, how much of a control you think you have over it. You really don't. Definitely not.